All right, we're good. Okay, welcome everybody. Um, welcome to our Shooting Preserve virtual meeting today. Obviously, this is the second time we, ha we had one with you folks starting in June. You were our first, um, I think you were our first uh, effort at doing this um, externally besides commission meetings. We've done several of these um, Zoom meetings now, some um, number of them internally, and we've done commission meetings via Zoom and now done more of the external meetings and and um, we've we've um, felt that they've worked pretty well. Um, they don't replace the in-person in meetings, but hopefully we'll get back to doing them before some long, uh, before very long. Anyway, uh, before we get going too far, I'm Arden Peterson, um, Special Assistant to Secretary Hepler, and I'll be facilitating today's meeting. The intent of today's meeting is to communicate with the uh, shooting preserve operators across the state, share current commission proposals and listen to feedback from each of you. Your input is important and so thank you for participating today. Um, now for a few housekeeping items for today's meeting. For those of you who are connected through the computer, there'll be a chat feature that Emily Keel, our senior advisor at Game Fish Parks will be monitoring. Um, I don't know if there's, Emily will have any questions to post on there, but you're sure welcome to post any questions that you may have or comments that you have as well. Um, when we were doing some wildlife damage uh, management uh, Zoom meetings here last week, we had a couple folks that weren't able to get through. There were some uh, technical issues. They couldn't get through on the mic, but they were able to get through on the chat feature. So it was helpful in that, in that regard of that meeting. So um, if you'd like to answer a question or share a comment orally, there'll be a toolbar on the bottom of your computer screen if you're using one, and that should allow you to raise your hand. If you can't locate the raise your hand feature, or if you're on your phone, you'd still like to, we'd still like to hear from you, so jo please join in. Everyone will be on mute when you come into the meeting, so you'll need to unmute your device when speaking for us to hear you. Um, if you're on your phone, you may have to hit star six to unmute. Um, I'll try my best to make sure that everyone who wants to ask a question today or provide a comment uh, has that opportunity. Uh, when I call on you, it would be helpful if you provide your name and preserve your re represent area of the state, that'd be helpful. Um, I'd appreciate you doing that. Uh, also, in addition, today's meeting is being recorded and will be made available on our website. Anything to add, Emily? Nope, you got it covered, Arden, thanks. Okay, sounds good. First of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Gay Fisher Park Secretary Kelly Hepler and turn the floor over to him for a few words, Kelly? Thanks, Arden. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And I want to recognize uh, Commissioner Jensen, Commissioner Lockham has joined the call. Thank you very much for that. And uh, Kurt Corzon is also on, and, and Kurt is a, is a member of our Habitat Foundation Board. So thank you, Kurt, for being on in two roles. So yeah, um, <clears throat> it's really been a neat summer in, in some way. I, I recorded a speech this morning. It's going to be played in a couple of weeks, but it's talking about how in, in the presence of COVID, we've actually expanded our geographic barriers. They kind of dissolved in a way, and we've actually communicated a lot with people. And this isn't the ideal way to do that. We just had a meeting earlier um, with some outfitters, and we were forced to make it face-to-face -face and social distance properly, and there wasn't a lot of us. That's important to do that, but also just where people are in their lives right now and working at home and, and um, working on the out in the fields and stuff, we don't have time to get together, and plus it makes it difficult where we are with COVID. So I appreciate you guys taking time. I think these communications are important. We have a commission meeting coming up in a couple of weeks. So I'm looking forward to hearing you know, some comments back on that. I'm sure both commissioners are, are that too. So I know you guys will provide a scan of comments, um, which I always appreciate. And uh, Dave Bean went out, and hi Dave, by the way, um, he went out and did a survey with all the, at least a lot of the <clears throat> operators, um, shooting preserve operators responded back to that and reviewing those comments. And I really do appreciate those kind of comments. And, you know, I realize they're not always be complimented on what we do as in GFNP, but we take those comments and we learn from them. And um, the thing we want to do with these kind of meetings is besides listen, also is to gain your trust and make this partnership because the operators are certainly a very important part of who we are in this state and important to Main Street, Main Street economy. So I'm looking forward to hearing from you and um, hope you enjoy this conversation. Thanks, Arden. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, Secretary Hepler has been a huge supporter of opening our lines of communication with all our customers and, and um, his leadership during this pandemic has been extremely valuable, both internally and externally. So thank you, Kelly. Um, 
Deputy Secretary Kevin Romling, do you have anything to add before we get started today? Ah, thanks, Arden. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks again for joining the call. Um, you know, it's been a good couple months here. Um, collaborative efforts have continued when we talk about different proposals, uh, different seasons, and uh, eager to hear the discussion today. Uh, thank you, commissioners, for joining the discussion and staff for putting this together. Um, no, I think Kelly covered most of it and just looking forward to having a, a good open discussion on all the things on the agenda. So thank you, Arden. Thanks, Kevin. Um, before we go any further, I'd like to make a couple of introductions. Um, we recently completed a little restructuring within the department, combining our conservation officers and park rangers into a new law enforcement section. Uh, Sam Scalhouse, who's a longtime CO and district CO supervisor, was chosen as a law enforcement section chief and will be leading the new section. While there'll be some changes internally that help streamline some of our law enforcement work as an agency, our officers will still be working on the same responsibilities as before, and you shouldn't really notice any difference from the outside. Uh, Sam, do you have anything to add? I uh, just want to say hello to everybody. Thanks for uh, allowing me to participate in this meeting and uh, look forward to just listening in and, and seeing where the meeting goes. Thank you, Sam. Um, I'm not sure if Mark is still on. Um, let's see. Um, got my screen minimized right now, but um, um, the other change or a minor change that we've made in, in the administrators, administration of the shooting preserve program um, is with Mark Ohm. Janelle Blaha will still remain as your main contact for reports, applications, et cetera, so that won't change. However, Mark, who is our regional supervisor out of Chamberlain, will now oversee the Shooting Preserve Program. Mark is also a longtime CO, CO supervisor, regional supervisor. I know many of you know Mark quite well, so this change should seem quite seamless to almost everybody. Uh, Mark, do you have anything you'd like to share? Uh, thanks, Arden. I just yeah, many of you have had the uh, misfortune of knowing me for quite a while, so uh, hopefully we can continue those relationships and, and, uh, and build on those as well. Um, for all of you, I would expect to, to see uh, my name on some emails coming up. We're going to try to ramp up communications uh, just like this and, and like some of the other emails that uh, communications that we've sent out. Um, one thing I would like to say, um, there are a couple of email addresses out there that we don't seem to be able to get quite right. So if, if you're getting this secondhand or if you know somebody that's not getting this information, please get me their contact so I can get the, the correct email address. But otherwise, I'm looking forward to these conversations and looking forward to getting to know everybody better and, and uh, working together on things. So thanks, Arden, and I'm going to be here to listen and answer questions. Thank you, Mark. Um, we'll kind of now jump into the agenda. Um, we have a number of topics to cover today. Uh, kill tag, supplies, permit cancellation, electronic reporting, preserve harv harvest limits, pheasant season structure proposals, marketing, and second century fund. I'll try to make sure everyone who wants to weigh in has an opportunity to do so, but I'll also try to keep things moving along as we go through this agenda. And at the end, um, before we're done, I'll also provide Kurt Corzan of the Upland Game Bird Association, an opportunity to discuss his organization as well. Um, and, and also after that, we'll have an opportunity for open discussion and, and questions. Um, and as we go through each one of these topics, feel free to uh, raise your hand, ask questions. Uh, we'll be respectful for everybody and I'll call on you uh, as we get to it. So with that, let's get started. Uh, Janelle, could you kick it off with Kill tag supplies, please. Uh, sure. So um, this year we had a, a quick problem with our kill tag vendor, um, and they weren't going to be able to deliver. Hey, hey, Janelle, we can't hear you real well, so I don't know if it's you know if you need to be closer or something going on, but all right, that's better. Thank we you. We got you now. Yep. Okay. I might go jump on with Dale. I can hear you real well right now, if that works. You can hear me? Yes. OK. Um, so we had a small problem with our kill tag vendor this year, and they weren't going to be able to deliver kill tags in the second season. Janelle, I think you better come over. 
Yeah, I we lost you. Better you. Come over. We lost okay. you again, so go hop in with Dale. <laughs> All right, hold on. All right. Okay. Um, She's got a problem with her computer, so yep. we're, we're working on that. This is how it's going through these things. We have to adjust a little bit on the fly, but for the most part, it's working pretty well. She's gathering up her stuff and coming on over. Okay, sounds good. We'll just wait a second for her. The floor is yours. All right. It's on me. All right, can you hear me now? We can. Welcome back. All right. Um, so, as I tried singing before, um, we had a small problem with our kill tag vendor this year, and um, they were not going to be able to deliver kill tags in time for the start of the season. The good news is, is we've rectified that problem, and we found a vendor who will be able to produce um, the kill tags in time for the start of the season. However, they're going to get us when they deliver it to us, that's going to leave a very short turnaround time for us to get tags out by September 1st. Um, so I would like each operator, if you could email me your first, um, the date of your first hunt for this season, um, that would greatly be appreciated. Um, and then I can prioritize and get tags out to those people who are starting on September 1st or, or shortly thereafter. Um, also, Dale and myself and possibly some other uh, department employees uh, may end up hand delivering these tags to you. So, especially if you're starting on September 1st. Um, so, please email me your, your start date so, so we can make sure everybody has kill tags in time for the start of your first hunt. Um, in addition, uh, most of you have placards on um, storage and transportations that you have hanging um, up in your facilities. Those are out of date and will need to be replaced. Uh, Dale will have those on hand while he's doing inspections. So when he stops, um, just go ahead and ask him. If he, if he doesn't remember, just go ahead and ask him for those replacement placards so that you can uh, hang those in, in your facilities. Um, and then as far as cancellation and deferments, so the department this year has extended the cancellation period for private shooting preserves. A letter went out in April um, kind of detailing uh, this information. So just as a reminder, you will have until September 1st to cancel your permit. And if you choose to cancel your permit, you will receive a 100% refund of all of your permit fees for this application period. The other option that is available is to defer your permit to, for this upcoming season. And in this case, if you choose to defer your permit, uh, you won't receive a refund. What we'll do is uh, we'll roll over those application fees to next year for the 2021-22 uh, season. Um, if you are thinking about doing this, you need to send in a signed and dated letter to myself uh, stating what your intent is if you're canceling or deferring. And those need to be postmarked prior to September 1, so prior to the start of the season. Um, I've gotten a lot of, or not a lot, but some emails with people who intend to do this, but I haven't gotten their letters yet. So if you could get those letters in, um, if you want, you can always scan the letter and e email it to me or take a picture on your phone and email it to me. That, that's fine too, but um, just keep in mind the September 1st deadline for those if you're choosing to go that route. Um, Dale's going to talk about records and our new record system. Okay, let's hang on just for a second and see if there's any questions for Janelle either on the kill tag supplies or on the permit cancellation or deferral. Any questions out there from anybody? Okay. I don't see any questions, so let's let's go ahead with Dale then. Okay, thanks, Arden and Janelle. Um, 
Right now across the state, we've got approximately 180 to 185 operators, um, private shooting preserve operators. And among those, again, this is approximate, about half of them are using written records with the other half using computerized. Of those who are using computerized records, I would guess about most of those folks are using some sort of an Excel file, either one that we provide or one that, uh, that they've come up with on our own that we have approved. Now where this comes into play is, is we, we get numerous information requests throughout the, throughout the year actually, not just during the preserve season, requests from the public, um, sometimes our, our administrative folks need some information, state lawmakers, and in fact, Shooting Preserve themselves have asked us for certain statistical information regarding Shooting Preserve usage. Now, if we get requests for things like, you know, harvest numbers, how many wild versus marked, et cetera, we can quickly access those numbers, but it comes, it's a problem with the system that we've got right now uh, coming up with any sort of... Uh, usage information regarding preserves. Basically the bottom line is this, with, with the two tiered system that we have, we, we really don't have a workable database in order to generate some of these um, numbers that we need to do. Uh, we really can't glean much of anything with our current system out of uh, about current, uh, about client usage statistics. Now, the one thing, we did get some requests from this this year, and we did spend a tremendous, and we're actually in the middle right now, of spending a tremendous amount of staff time um, compiling some of these requests. But what we need to do with that is we need to take our handwritten database and our computer database and somehow co-locate them into the same system where we can do some of these, uh, some of these searches. Now where this comes into play is we're, we are currently testing a, we're, and we're rolling out with about six lodges right now, a new system that, uh, that will bring some of these things together and give us a better, uh, a better system to get to come up with some of the information that we need. Now this will, um, there'll be two things that we can gain from this. Number one, we can, we can get uh, some of the statistics we need, but number two, we can considerably streamline the data entry process. And this is, this is kind of key for our shooting preserve operators. For example, what this will allow as far as streamlining is, for example, when you are entering in a guest to your guest register, currently you have to just pretty much with your writing or with your computer, you have to write in, enter those in each time. With a database of your guest register, of your guests that will be assigned to each lodge, in other words, you only have access to your own database. If the, if the name is already in there, for example, if you type in first three letters of the last name, the rest of the information that is tied to a record will come down and give you a pick list of, and then you from there can pick the right name. What that will do then, once you put those three characters into the last name, it will self-populate the rest of those fields that include things like, you know, the address and the DL, which will significantly reduce input time for your guest registers. So that's what we're looking at, at doing with this, uh, test program. Like I say, there's six lodges. I'm, I'm in the middle of uh, getting that database tested and we'll be rolling that out to those six lodges here over the next couple of weeks or so, depending on when those folks start hunting. Now one heads up, I, I do want to mention here to everybody is that the department is looking at phasing out eventually handwritten records for the reasons that I outlined above. Um, we're not going to do this overnight, and uh, certainly the preserve operators will be involved in the process, but over the next couple, three years or so, maybe around 2023, we're looking at phasing that part of the process out, and we're really to the point where I don't think the department can really justify not coming up with some of the information requests that we're getting without, like I say, uh, donate or um, expending a lot of staff time just to get some pretty, really very simple statistics. So that, that's, our, that's where we're at right now. Um, if anybody has any questions or so forth about uh, what we've got planned here, let me know. Any questions out there on electronic reporting?
questions or comments about it? Seeing none. Okay, uh, we'll move on. Uh, next on the agenda, Kevin, um, Kevin Roebling, I'd like you to cover the shooting preserve limit proposal, if you would. Yeah, thank you, Arden. Um, for everybody on the on the line here, this conversation has been kind of ongoing for quite some time, but it really took uh, took root here at the July commission meeting. Um, a proposal was presented to the commission at the July commission meeting regarding the unrestricted um, uh, license, if you will, for harvest. And at the end of the day, what this would allow then is a preserve hunter to harvest uh, unrestricted birds on a preserve if that is the desire of the hunter. Um, however, that hunter would have to have, in a sense, a, a different license type. Um, the way it was presented to the commission back in July was it was an endorsement concept where the hunter would have to actually purchase an unrestricted license type on top of their already existing uh, one day, five day, um, could have been a non-resident small game license or an annual preserve license. So it was more of an endorsement type concept. That license, uh, we put a fee on it for discussion purposes of $150. Uh, those dollars then were gonna go directly to habitat enhancements and improvements on public land. Um, and the other thing regarding this license concept was everybody in the hunting party would have to acquire that um, unrestricted license as an endorsement. So everybody in the hunting party would have to have the actual um, unrestricted license on top of a license they've already had. So we've had some conversations on that concept and there are definitely some pros and cons to it. Um, in, the, in the course of the last I would say 45 days in those conversations. There has been conversations occurring um, with the Upland Outfitters Association, uh, the South Dakota Upland uh, Outfitters Association, and they did come to us with a, a wording proposal or a rule language proposal that is a little bit different than that. It's a different concept, and um, we'll cover that here in a second. But right now, what's in front of the commission is the endorsement concept. And uh, of that $150 fee on top of um, their already existing license. And the commission will take action on this proposal, but this proposal obviously can still be amended. Um, it can be adjusted in a lot of different ways. The public notice was very broad in scope. Uh, for the sole purposes, this was a conversation starter. Uh, this proposal was, and this is exactly the, the platform we wanted to have this discussion in is with industry uh, folks that this directly impacts. So with that, I'd like to turn this over to uh, Matt McCauley. He is representing the South Dakota Upland Outfitters Association to discuss some of the proposed changes that they would like to see uh, to the proposal that's currently in front of the commission. And uh, with that, Matt, if you wanted to go through a couple of those proposed changes, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh Mr. Deputy Secretary and Mr. Secretary uh, Hepler and Commissioners Lockett and Jensen, thanks for uh, joining us this afternoon and for hosting this meeting. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you, Matt. Excellent, thank you. Um, uh, well, and good afternoon to everybody uh, from the industry from across the state and everyone joining us on the Zoom call. Uh, these aren't the most ideal ways to communicate, but I do appreciate the, the communication. Um, the, the, the department, I've been listening and working on this issue for a number of years. And the uh, department was kind enough yesterday to send out a draft administrative rule that we sent out to the industry and the interested parties just for consideration as a possible alternative to implementing, uh, to, to removing some of the regulatory barriers uh, to harvesting additional birds on preserves and allowing preserves to innovate and adapt in this very challenging economic climate. Um, the proposal essentially would say that the, would leave the 20 bird limit in place in rule uh, and would allow a hunter, a preserve hunter, in the case of a resident, to purchase a combination license and a habitat stamp and hunt. And those limits then would not apply. And in the case of a non-resident, they would need to purchase a non-resident small game license plus a habitat stamp. And then in that case, the existing um, administrative rules would not apply to that hunter as well on a preserve. Uh, and in the case of groups, 
uh, the group would only be as strong as its weakest link. And so what that means is if you had a group of 10 and uh, eight were residents and two were non-residents, uh, they would all have to have a habitat stamp. The residents would need the combination license and the non-residents uh, who are hunting on a preserve would need the non-resident small game license. And so this proposal would essentially use the existing, would mean no new licenses would be created. It would just require a combination of licenses and, re and require if the preserve hunter wanted to do so or wanted the opportunity to exceed the um, regulatory limits of 20 birds uh, in a day uh, would need that special combination of licenses and be hunting in a group where everybody in that group had that license. So we were looking to try and keep this on behalf of the association, try and keep this simple. Um, that was one of our objectives, not change any fees or adopt any new licenses. Um, we were not, this proposal would not eliminate the bag limits. It would just provide a pathway to exceed those in the event that certain uh, conditions were met. It would not require uh, preserve hunters to have a habitat stamp. Uh, the existing limit of 20 would still apply to those that didn't. And so um, for those preserves who didn't want to take advantage of this um, opportunity or this pathway, uh, there would be no changes, no additional cost to the preserve no additional cost to any preserve hunter that didn't that that was okay hunting 20 bird or harvesting 20 uh, preserved birds or or fewer. Um, no increase in fees. Uh, would no repealing of existing rules or regulations. Um, and again, it would just be a pathway for, for potentially shooting more birds if the hunter and if the preserve wanted to provide um, that option. Uh, this is consistent with the framework that I talked about about 60 days ago um, when the commission was kind enough and the, um, um, the GFP staff and the agency was kind enough to host this Zoom call uh, and making this optional, not requiring anyone to do it, uh, but allowing businesses to innovate in this challenging environment. And just as I've talked to preserve owners, I know there are some that won't want to do this and that's perfectly fine. It wouldn't create a, uh, any obligation to do that. Um, if a preserve wanted to offer this and allow hunters to exceed that, that market or that price would be set between the hunters and the preserve and those arrangements would obviously need, need to be made um, in advance. Um, but certainly if a preserve wanted to offer this option, wouldn't apply to everyone because it would be optional based on this combination of licenses that was purchased. Um, and if a, a preserve was interested, uh, they could take in provide this option to their hunters um, based on the license combination. So I'd just like to throw that out there uh, for the commission staff and for the commission to consider and for the industry to debate. Um, again, trying to uh, keep it simple, uh, keep the industry flexible and nimble and understanding that all across the state in the 180 or so plus preserves and uh, lodges that are out there um, everyone's got a different business model. I've hunted on, I think, 10, at least 10, if not 15 different preserves across the state. And, and what I love about every single one is everybody's different. Everyone's got a different style, different personality, uh, different guides, different way of doing the hunts. And uh, this model would allow our uh, industry in South Dakota to continue to innovate. Uh, it would uh, not be a one size fits all um, and would allow uh, hunters and lodges the option to proceed um, accordingly. Uh, one last thing, I, I do want to um, just from a big picture perspective make this point. Uh, this is not unlimited shooting of birds. Uh, it would remove the regulatory restriction, uh, but there would still be practical and pragmatic limits on the number of birds that could be harvested. Um, you all know that South Dakota is one of the only states to have a rule like this. Uh, you would still need a license. You'd still need a hunter who's willing to make these economic arrangements with a preserve. You'd still need a willing preserve, um, a seller, so to speak, a lodge that wants to provide this service and provide uh, this pathway. Some of the lodges even today have limits in their packages of three birds or five birds uh, with additional fees. So none of, that, none of that would change. And of course, the hunters would still need to follow the hours of operation still need to um, comply with the wanton waste rules, making sure birds that are shot are picked up and cleaned and not left to waste. 
um, the birds would need to be available on the lodge. And that means, of course, releasing those birds in advance and having them out there in sufficient number uh, to comply with the law and would still need to have the kill tags uh, applied to them after a harvest. Uh, so with that, um, Kevin, I'll, I'll stand by for questions, but just wanted to throw out the concept for discussion and uh, appreciate your consideration. Yeah. Okay. I guess I would open that up to Kevin, unless you want to wrap that up a little bit. Otherwise, I'd open it up for questions for either Matt or Kevin. But Kevin, I'll let you um, make any comments that you have first. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Matt, for going over that proposal. Um, this is a this would be a great time to have a, a more thorough discussion on the concept. Um, what are the preserve operators out there on the line thinking of this concept uh, regarding the pros and cons? We'd sure like to hear from you at this time if it was possible. Any, anyone out there that would like to speak to this? Any of you uh, shooting preserve operators? I'll say something about it. Kevin, go ahead. So at the last commission's meeting, it got brought up about the kill tags and the fees of the kill tags. And when, when we started talking about the enhanced limit and bringing up the limit, we were talking about, you know, how many preserves it's going to affect, which was going to end up being maybe a dozen, maybe less than that. And then it got brought up at the commission meetings about the 25 cent kill tags and about those being increased. So there's going to be more people, more of us preserve guys who are not going to be shooting over 20 birds a day. But then, I mean, what, what uh, Matt's proposal was, was good and I agree to that, but I just don't want to see down the road that you guys as the game fish and parks come back and say, well, you know, we've en enhanced the kill, or we've enhanced the limits. So now all of a sudden we're gonna change the fee for the preserve for $300 to $400. And we're gonna change the price per acre from 40 cents to 50 cents, or we're gonna change the kill tags from 25 to whatever. Since we've raised there, since we let we passed the law that they can shoot more birds. Now all of a sudden that's gonna affect me where I have absolutely zero desire to ever shoot over 20 birds a guy. And we talked about how if we change this, that it, it needs to be focused on those preserves where all of us other smaller guys don't get roped into it, say one year or two years down the road where it gets compared to, well, we did this, so now they can do this and it's all of us. So I just, you know, if it gets passed, I hope something like that doesn't happen. Thanks, Kevin. Or Kevin Shoemaker, uh, Kevin Robling, I don't know if you want to take a shot at, at a response there. Yeah, absolutely, Kevin. I appreciate those comments, and, and they're, they're definitely legitimate concerns. I totally understand what you're saying. And at this time, the department has no desire nor interest to bring any sort of fee increase on the preserve fees themselves or the kill tags. That was all done in, I believe, 2011 when those fees increased. Um, there has been no discussions on any of that as far as an increased fee. And, and I don't see that happening in the very near future or in, you know, far out future either. So I agree, we don't want this X to affect Y. And um, at the end of the day, there's no desire, at least from the department side uh, to do so. Any All right, other... good. We appreciate that. Thanks again, Kevin. Any other questions or comments out there? from preserve operators. Any other questions or comments in regards to this? Um, Commissioners Jensen or Locken, do you have any questions or any comments in regards to this? I don't mean to put you on the spot, just asking if you have any, I'll give you an opportunity if you have any questions or comments. Okay. The only, uh, uh, Arden, the only comment I'd uh, have is uh, encourage the uh, preserve owners, if they've got friends that are involved with it, let us know what their thoughts are. It's, uh, we need to make the decision for the whole state and, and any information we get, we'd appreciate. Thank you, Commissioner Larkin. See, Arden, I 
before we wrap this one up, I do want to make folks aware of the public comment period is currently going on. Um, the date or the deadline for submission, I believe, is uh, right at the end of August here. So we got about a week left to submit public comments on this proposal and the proposals Tom will cover here in just a second. So we encourage folks to um, either write in a letter. Uh, it's pretty easy to go to our online submission form under, under commission tab on our website. And like Commissioner Locken stated, it, it really is helpful when the industry, you know, speaks and, and tells us how they feel about issues such as this and many others. So we really do want to hear your feedback. Um, and we'll have more discussions on this in the future. Now, what this will look like is we'll take action on this proposal, on this uh, unrestricted license proposal. Currently, it's in the form that I discussed earlier, and there'd have to be an amendment to that proposed um, uh, rule, I should say, and then whatever it comes out of the amendment would then be voted on, likely at the September 2nd meeting. So it's coming around the corner, and uh, we really do encourage um, engagement and discussion. And if there's anybody that wants to send Art an email, myself or anybody else, uh, we do truly appreciate that feedback. So thank you, Arden, for the time on this one, and uh, that might wrap that up unless there's any other comments for folks to be made. Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate that. Any other comments out there on regards to the shooting preserve limit proposal? Kevin, is Matt's proposal part of what we received from Rachel today? Is that in that packet? No, it's it's not actually um, because it's not in the form of a, a formal proposal. Um, we we will get that in front of you, commissioners, though, and. We would be presenting that. Matt will likely be presenting that as an amendment um, from the South Dakota Outfitter Upland Outfitters Association. So that'll all be part of, of the discussion. But right now the current proposal form is, is what we currently have in front of us. We'd have to go in and have the commission amend that proposal first before we can take on a new one. So there'll need to be some formal action if an amendment is where the commission wants to go. But you'll get it to us before the meeting, I take it. Absolutely. I wanted to have this conversation first, and then my next order of operations was to reach out to all the commissioners with this amendment proposal. Yes, absolutely. Then is it, I mean, is the department looking at this as if that amendment would be proposed and passed, then we go out for another public comment period or not? The, the scope of the public notice um, and the way this rule is written that Matt presented would fit underneath that public notice scope. Um, so there wouldn't necessarily need to be another 60 day comment period. Um, if that were to happen, this would not be implemented for the 20 season. So we're, we're a little bit up against the clock on this one, um, but that's up for the commission to consider too. Uh, as far as the legal notifications and things, we would meet those requirements. But if that all happened at the September meeting, then what opportunity would the public have to consider the to, to consider Matt's proposed amendment or whatever we're calling it? Yeah, no, great, great comment, Commissioner. And one of the things, uh, like Matt alluded to um, earlier, is we did share the draft rule language with all 186 preserve operators, so they do have an idea of what that language might look like. Um, you know, this does impact the industry directly, and that's the folks we really want to engage with are those preserve operators. But you're right. I mean, there won't be, there won't be a lot of time there, and that is something we need to discuss. Okay, thanks. Thanks for those questions, Commissioner Jensen. Any other comments or questions on the uh, shooting preserve uh, limit proposal before we move on? Seeing none, uh, we'll move on to the pheasant season structure uh, proposals and uh, Wildlife Division Director Tom Kirschman, I'd like you to cover that if you would. Yeah, sure Arden, thank you and good afternoon everybody. Thanks for joining the call today. At our last uh, Zoom meeting, we had talked about the potential concepts of some adjustments to the regular pheasant, pheasant season structure with you and at that time, we talked about all three of the areas that are currently on the commission proposal. And we received a lot of good feedback and questions from all of you at that time and, and actually helped in formulating what 
the department recommendation was to the commission as they considered proposals to changes to the pheasant season. Um, so quickly, I'm gonna run over the three uh, changes that the commission has in front of them right now as a proposal that they will look to take, uh, make some final decisions and take final action at their upcoming September meeting. So one, the first item would be that first week of the pheasant season, it begins at 10 o'clock. Um, and then the second week of the season, it then um, goes up to uh, the noon timeframe. What this would be is to make the entire season to begin at, at uh, 10 o'clock for the entire season. The second change to the pheasant season would be extending the season later into the year. Right now, the current pheasant season structure uh, ends on the first Sunday of January. Um, we had brought forward a couple of alternatives and had discussions with the commission and what the commission decided to move forward with as a proposal to take public comment was to extend the, the pheasant season to January 31st. And then the third recommended change was the one that we had probably most discussion on at your last call. It was in respect to the daily bag limit. Um, brought forward and the commission moved forward a proposal where that daily bag limit would increase from three birds a day to four beginning on December 1 of the hunting season and go through the end of the hunting season. Um, but should that move forward, that actually would not be implemented until the 2021 hunting season. And that implementation start date was a direct byproduct of the conversations that we had with you folks on our last Zoom call. So those are the three items that the commission is looking at right now, taking public comment. Uh, we've received quite a bit of comment. I would say there's a mixture out there of where folks are at in respect to these uh, recommended changes or proposal, proposed changes to the pheasant season. Certainly we have people in support of some things. Uh, some folks are in opposition and some are lukewarm. Um, but we've received primarily comments about the two of the main, two of the three items and that being the extension of the season and then they increase the daily bag limit from three to four. Um, we also know that we've received actually some comments from some of you folks on the phone here today as well. Uh, so those are the changes that are being proposed right now. Again, the commission will take final action at their September meeting. And uh, wanted to bring this up to you again because it is in front of the commission and thought this would be a great opportunity to hear firsthand from some of you folks on these proposed changes to the pheasant season. So. Arden, that's a quick summary of it. I guess what I would do is turn it back to you and maybe open it up to any of the preserve operators on the call today to provide any feedback or comment on these proposed changes. Thank you, Tom. I, I appreciate that overview. And yes, I will open that up now for questions, comments from the shooting preserve operators or, or anybody else on this call. Tom, would it be helpful to, to explain why these proposals are being made, the foundation for it really, and I, going back to Commissioner Whitmire and his analysis, and then the sure. analysis that's happened after that? Yeah, sure, I'll provide a little bit more. So as the department and commission and a, a marketing work group went through a process and talking about pheasant marketing, one of the things that a byproduct of those conversations came up was, were there some other opportunities within the current pheasant season structure to provide more opportunity to pheasant hunters, both residents and non-residents? And then we also had a lot of conversations between the commission and the department about some actual pheasant statistics, in particular, what we were gathering in our winter sex ratio surveys in that January, February timeframe in respect to the number of hens per roosters that we've been seeing. Um, so first part of it, looking at some opportunity standpoint, that's really where the first two proposed changes came into play and in changing the start time uh, to 10 a.m. for the entire season, that, although it really only impacts the first weekend of the season or the first week of the season. The bigger one, the extension there, looking at it from the standpoint of more opportunity for pheasant hunters uh, certainly, as some of you are well aware, there's some other states out there, Nebraska and Kansas in particular, that go to the end of January. When we looked at that, um, you know, there is the question of the severe weather that may occur in January. Does that have a negative impact on the birds? You know, we just don't have any solid information, nor is there research that would indicate that that would have a negative impact. 
uh, two birds out there. If the weather is that difficult or that that extreme, the likelihood of many hunters being out there is probably very, very slim. So we really don't see a biological factor in this, um, but it certainly would provide more hunting opportunity. Uh, we also look at it from the standpoint of a license that you hold in your pocket right now. That license is valid through the end of January. And so from the close date, that would make sense when you look at it from a license perspective as well. The, the third proposed change, increasing the daily bag limit from three to four, is a conversation that stemmed from Commissioner Whitmire and our a few other commissioners in the department looking at those pheasant data and statistics. Uh, over the past five, six years in particular, we've seen a steady increase in the number of um, available roosters that would be uh, out there after the hunting season closes. Um, that ratio has continued to uh, expand and just the number of roosters out there for available harvest appears to be higher and higher. And so we looked at it from the standpoint of more opportunity uh, to increase that daily bag limit for that late season hunting opportunities. Hence why the commission has that proposal of December 1 through the remainder of the pheasant season, whether that season gets extended or stays as its current structure or somewhere in between. Um, so that's kind of the quick history and background for those proposed changes and consideration by the commission. Thank you, Tom, for that overview. Uh, Commissioner Jensen, did any other any any other comments or questions, or did Tom cover that well enough? Yeah, no, Tom covered that well. Thank you. All Tom. right, all right, thank you. Uh, any questions or comments out there in regards to the pheasant season structure proposals that are in front of the commission? I have one. Okay, who do we have? Um, this is uh, Shane with Horseshoe K Ranch, uh, North. Hey, got you, Shane. Go ahead, Shane. Yep. Um, my deal is is uh, with the wild population of birds numbers being lower. Why would we up the limit? to four after December. I feel that um, I put enough pheasants out there and I have a lot left over, but I think that also helps me with my wild population of hens through the winter um, with the predators. Yeah, they're getting the roosters, the pen raised ones, but they're leaving my wild ones alone. And uh, making the season longer, um, doesn't make sense either because as a preserve I can hunt until September so anybody that wants to hunt find a preserve to hunt on or um, I guess I'm not for sure I'm just I'm not wild about um, either one of them Tom you want to respond yeah, thanks for those comments, Shane. And, and we've, we've heard some of those comments as well. In particular, uh, several folks have written in and have reached out about the similar comment that you made about, you know, their perception and in their particular area of pheasant numbers might be lower right now than they were a few years back. Why, why increase the daily bag limit? You know, the, the fortunate thing in respect to that is when we talk about pheasant hunting and uh, their um, the fact that we can and we do distinguish between roosters and hens and focus the harvest on roosters um, from a biological standpoint and the perspective of potentially doing irreversible damage to the population moving forward just isn't there. Um, so we do have that ability, fortunately, when it comes to a pheasant population to focus that harvest on roosters. Uh, we just we don't see it as a population hindrance or uh, anything that would have um, Again, irreversible damage to the population itself, but it's certainly a comment that we've heard from, from numerous folks out there of the timing of it uh, when the pheasant numbers aren't as high right now as maybe as in previous years. Thank you, Shane. Thank you, Tom. Any other questions or comments out there? I have one. This is Cody Warren, Warren Go Ranch is north of Pier. Go ahead, Cody. I, I have a hard time believing that we have numbers of total birds across the state been have been going down for the past five years, about every year, and now all of a sudden we have all these extra roosters late season. That doesn't make a lick of sense to me. 
I, I just don't see it around, you know, where I've seen in the people I've talked to. You start putting pressure on all, I mean, not just pheasant hunting, but you're putting pressure on all animal that time of the year, being able to go out and feed, you know, just like the goose hunting. Since you extended the limit on that and the season on that, now it's just harder and harder to hunt geese because they just don't stay around. They get pushed out and there's just too much pressure on them, but that's just my view. Thank you. Thank you, Cody. Any, I'd like any, to comment also, Arden. Casey, go ahead. Uh, Casey Griffith, I uh, run the Snake Den Lodge in Presho. Uh, and I've spoke to quite a few guys in the Lyman County area, especially some of them involved in commercial hunting. Some of them just uh, do kind of a friends and family thing. And I haven't heard many people in, in favor of uh, increasing the limit, especially. Um, and kind of everybody's been maybe a little indifferent on the extending the season to January 31, just because I don't think they just don't get a lot of um, people wanting to come hunt in January anyways. It's because of the weather or they've turned to other things, whatever the case may be. But uh, the increase in the limit to four birds seems to be the, the most um, detrimental to me. And, and I understand the the biology and the ecology of it and it not having much you know um, biological impact on the population but I think in in, in theory uh, you're going to see more dissatisfaction uh, with your hunters um, you know by raising the limit and there's just not many places I don't think that that we see that you can go and shoot four birds a day and and like some of the other guys Shane and Cody said I think you're putting undue stress um, you know on the wildlife, not only the pheasants, but other wildlife in general. Um, you know, you're spending more time in the field, you're hunting more property, um, you know, and like everybody else, you know, I, I'd have to put more birds out. You know, we run both preserve and non-preserve land. Um, you know, if they want to shoot extra birds, we can go to the preserve. It's, it's kind of that simple. And, um, you know, I don't see the average Joe coming to South Dakota in December or January and going to public land and having much success. But I feel like increasing the limit to four, we're kind of putting that perception out there that the birds are here, come and get them. But I, I feel like they're uh, going to be highly disappointed in what they find. Um, you know, most of the public land around here is, is pretty decimated by uh, the first couple of weeks of the season. Um, and it, it, it doesn't seem to get much better after that. So uh, I, I know I'm against it. And I've, like I said, I've talked to a lot of other people that, that are too. Um, and I think we're kind of setting ourselves up for, for a little bit of a disappointment. You know, we didn't, I didn't agree with it when the birds were extraordinary back in, I think, 08, 09, 2010, stuff like that. I think this proposal came forward and um, got shot down and we had a lot more birds back then, but um I still wouldn't have been a fan. So uh, I'm kind of in agreement with everybody else so far that uh, it's, it's uh, not a good idea. Thank you. Thank you for those comments, Casey. Um, any other comments or questions from the folks? Who, who do we have here? Shane, Shane again. Yeah. Yep, yes. that's Shane. Go ahead. Um, where are you getting your numbers um, for the population of roosters? Are you going to preserves and getting them? Because I feel if you go across the state and if you would put a mandatory ban on road hunting within a half a mile or a mile of a preserve, you would not be able to limit a car load out of three or more people in a day's time. Tom, can you answer the, the numbers question there anyway? Yeah, thanks for that question, Shane. So the answer to your question is where do we get the numbers in respect to those hen versus rooster ratios? We conduct what's called a winter sex ratio survey. It happens in the months of January, February, and March, where staff across the state go out and count pheasants, uh, both roosters and hens. Uh, opportunistically and throughout the areas where they work and all the counties in eastern South Dakota we try to get 
bird counts in, in all the areas, all the counties. Um, so for example, last year we counted in excess of 17,000 birds. Um, they also focused their efforts away from preserves, uh, just knowing full well, obviously you folks do release birds to try to help eliminate some of those numbers, but also comes with that challenge I will offer to you is that obviously there's folks beyond just you as preserve operators that release birds also out there. And the, and the primary emphasis obviously is releasing roosters. But what I sh can share with you over the last four or five years is that number of roosters has continually gone up. Um, historically, we were at that somewhere between oh, 25 to 35 uh, roosters per 100 hens. Here in the last four or five years, that number has gone up into the 40s, 50s, 60s, and even higher now. So there's, there's some things that we have to look at in there, but that's the data and information that we use in that conversation. And that's, that's where we collected that data from. Thank you, Tom. I, hey, Tom, this is Cody Warren again. Do you, do you have that actual study? I would love to see that and see where all these birds are at. And I've, I've never seen anywhere that late in the season where you have that ratio of roosters to hens and that many roosters to hens as our population is going down everywhere because of habitat and predators and everything else. I would, I would love to see that. Yeah, Cody, we can line you up with our upland game biologists and have that conversation and he can show you and walk you through that data and how we, how it was collected and, and show you that information. So certainly we have that and we can, we can have that conversation and walk you through that. Thank you. I have Here. another question. Casey, go ahead. Yeah. It, I guess if we're, um, it, it seems a little bit uh, strange to me that we, d the department decided not to do the brood route survey anymore because it was maybe not the best way to um, get flat factual information or set, uh, you know, season structure for the pheasant season, but we're going to use the sex ratio study which would I assume maybe has the same faults or same biases that, that the brood route survey would to, to determine some of these um, or help set, you know, some of the structure within the pheasant survey. So, I, you know, I find that hard to believe. And the same thing, I don't see the, the numbers, um, you know, especially in our area. And maybe it's because, you know, it's a, it's a highly pressured area um, but I mean, I, I travel a lot of area in Lyman County, which I think is probably one of the better bird areas in the state. And, uh, you know, I've never seen 60 to 70 roosters per hundred hens. Um, I don't know for a long time, I don't care what time of year it is, but, uh, so I just, I find that difficult and, and maybe we're seeing that increase because more people are releasing birds to make up for the lack of wild birds. And then those birds are maybe um, congregating in unpressured areas. So, you know, maybe that's skewing the data some, but uh, uh, I, I just, I find it hard to believe that we're gonna eliminate one survey um, because it doesn't provide the information that we want, but use another survey to, to get us somewhere else where we wanna be, I guess. I, I got a comment too, just real quick, like on uh, on what we've okay. been talking. Um, Andy Hansen from uh, Dakota Ringneck over on the east side of the state. And, you know, I guess I go on, on both sides of this. Um, you know, I guess we as preserve operators, uh, for us, it's all about marketing, right? Um, so we need to look at the state is just trying to market, no different than we are. Um, a lot of their, um, you know, salaries and different things like that come off of, off of, license and obviously out of state license and different things like that are, are where um, there's a little bit more money involved. So we can't really blame them for just trying, they are, the state is just trying to market as well. You know, we have to look beyond just ourselves that the state is also trying to market. So um, to their point, um, I mean, to be honest with you, it doesn't matter in our area, it doesn't matter if you put the state limit to 15, it doesn't matter. People aren't walking out with their limit. They're not, they're, 
you know, just in our area, they're walking out with, they're happy if they come and get two birds. So the increase doesn't really um, affect us a whole lot um, as preserve operators. But I think what the concern for the preserve operators is, is that if we do increase the numbers um, and we do increase the season, that the only people who are going to see more pressure is ourselves. So um, I can see the state's reason and why they want to do what they're doing. But I mean, I just I mean, think that, that why the, why the, the operators are hesitant is because we just know that it's just going to put more pressure on, on our land. And like we already mentioned, road hunters, um, you know, we live right by Lake Ponce. And, you know, I mean, at times it's busier than the highway with people driving by our land back and forth. So I, I, I get the state's point in wanting to do this because you guys are trying to advertise the state and stuff like that. I just think that, you know, where it's going to put more pressure on is it's not more people are going to hunt um, you know, walk-in areas, because our walk-in areas get hit like crazy, but it's going to put more pressure on ours, you know, where we have, I, we have sloughs right by the, right by the road, and, you know, I mean, I said that's where the birds are going to be in the winter, so more and more people are just going to be driving by our place when it does get later, so that's the only thing where I see there's maybe a little bit of a hiccup is, I get that you guys are trying to advertise, but I just think that as preserve operators, we're the ones that are going to see more pressure than what the actual state ground is going to see. All right. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Kevin, looks like you so, want to yeah, have a comment. Um, so my deal is one with extending the season to January, you know, 31st. Um, obviously, all of us preserve guys can hunt till end of March. Uh, my proposal to the commissioners would be if you do decide to extend the season to January 31st, is that when it comes to the first Sunday in January, like it always is, that there's no longer any more road hunting because when you, you know, like in our area, we have all our cattle brought back to our farm by then. So does all of our other neighbors do. And I know you guys always talk that you guys try to get the landowners and the hunters to get along better. So the landowners will let the hunters go into their property. And most of the time we've had two or three blizzards by then. Some of the roads you can't get down and all the ditches are full of snow. And then they also talked to the commission's meeting about chasing all the birds out of a slough or a shelter belt out in the middle of a, you know, a blizzard or a cold or for the night. Well, if the ditches are full of snow and the guy who's road hunting, he's going to stop at the end of the tree or like the other gentleman just said, a slough that's 20 yards off the road just by him stopping is going to chase the birds out. But if you, but if you don't, if you, you know, stop the road hunting come January 30, you know, January the first Sunday in January, just like when the season would end, that would still give all these other guys opportunities to go hunt the public shooting areas versus driving around on the roads. I mean, we all know how much snow is in the roads come January. I mean, the ditches are full of snow. And then that would be more of a uh, thing for like all the, you know, not so much those preserve guys, but just other landowners. Cause by then, like I said, by then, majority of us, we have all our cattle back and they're all by the trees, by the farms, we're feeding them corn, you know, hay and everything else. And we all know how the birds like to pick on that stuff. So that's my whole theory behind that. As far as the four bird limit goes, you know, I think it's gonna be tough that that even gets passed, but I understand both ways how, you know, how it might enhance some of the people to come back and hunt, you know, to get them come back. Obviously when they come back, they're spending money dollars in South Dakota, which is obviously good for us. Maybe you don't go dead December 1st. Maybe you push back to January 1st or December 15th. Maybe you change that date because how many, I mean, I hunt clear till the end of March, but how many of the other guys, you know, or regular guys don't hunt that late? And then one other thing on extending the season, a lot of guys around our area, you know, they, they'll hunt pheasants for the first month and then they stop hunting, well, not even the first month, basically the first three weekends. And then they stop hunting it because they, they keep it for deer hunting. And then when the deer hunting season ends, which sometimes is middle December, then they go back and try to hunt, you know, and then that, if you extend the season, that would let them the opportunity to hunt more. Again, if, if you kick away the road hunting, I mean, if, if Randy Dawson and Tim Peters, the guys that hunt around my place, they've been doing it for 50 years. 
they're going to go out and go pheasant hunting at 10 in the morning. They've been hunting pheasants enough to know to be done hunting by two hours before sunset so all the birds come back in. Or they know enough not to hunt a quarter. So I don't think even if because people say that you're going to kill the population, the guys who've been doing it long enough, they know what to do not to kill the population. So they're going to be done in time. But again, if you're done in time and all the birds are coming back and you have the one guy who drives by your property 10 minutes before sunset when you know he can't road hunt because of all the snow in the ditch, just him stopping is going to kick the birds up. So, I mean, that's going to kill more of the birds than us hunting them in the long run. But, but yeah, I'm interested to see what happens with the proposal come in September. So, Thank you, Kevin. Thank you for those comments. Um, anybody else have any comments or questions in regards to the pheasant season structure proposals? We've got time for maybe a couple more, and then be, we'll move on to the next part of our agenda. Seeing none, I think we'll move on to the. Am I on there? Oh, yep. Is this, <laughs> is this Kevin? Yeah, yeah. Kevin Tevidal? Yeah, go ahead. Hey, Pheasant City Lodge. And really, all I want to do is stamp my approval on both Ken and Kevin. And just the, every comment they said was exactly what I was going to say. So they make my talk short, but exactly right. I mean, all they're going to do is drive by like they do right now and, and clean out our shelter belts right before dark. And we can't have that guys to be real honest about it. That is probably the biggest detriment that we would face in January and late December. And to be honest about it, uh, you know, the guys that don't have preserves that would maybe entertain some hunters, it's darn hard to get somebody to come from out of state to go hunting in January, let alone, I mean, December, let alone January. So, you know, on the, in the beginning of this, when I first heard it, I was kind of on the fence, kind of like Ken was, but the more I thought about it and the more I just don't see enough benefit to the state right now. And then the other thing is if we did ever bring this four bird limit in, is it something that would go statewide? Because the guys that don't have preserves that I've talked to about it all say the same thing. It's like, man, we don't want to have to be out there hunting for another bird or letting more birds go. I mean, even guys that don't have preserves, all these birds are released that you guys are counting out there. I No, not all of them, but I mean, the majority of them are by far. So the guys that don't have preserves are saying the same thing the preserves are saying is, no, I'm a preserve that doesn't shoot 10 birds a day. You know, we shoot five or three. And uh, they're saying the same thing. We don't want to have to be out there hunting for another bird. We like to limit three like it is. And, and especially in these conditions where you know you're having to release them whether you're a preserve or not so i appreciate all the comments and that, that's mine thanks thank you kevin appreciate I'm that gonna, i'm gonna say one more thing so like when, when he when we when i talk about the rowan hunting i mean like i said i mean on our area we are really really strict on road hunting if you shoot a pheasant across our property or buy our cattle we instantly call the game warren he gets a day if he doesn't come out in a day we call tips hotline we prosecute as many as we can and when it comes in january you know when someone's driving by our property and if and if it's a road on your rule and they shoot it between the fences that's great that's more power to them i mean i know the business i know the law i put out the pheasant that pheasant touches the, you know the ground is property of the game fish and parks no one comes to my place and say hey i ran over one of your pheasants that broke my fender in my car well it's not my problem. It's the game fish and parks because it's your pheasants. I mean, I understand the road hunting. But when, when it gets in the winter months, when the snow is going to be full of, you know, when the ditches are full of snow, we're going to know exactly how many pheasants are getting in the road. I mean, they're not going to be in the road. They're going to be in the trees or in the cover and so forth. And, I mean, if it gets past, I mean, when we catch them, I mean, like I said, our guys around here are really good by prosecuting every single one of them. And it just gets it harder and harder, not so much for us, but the other landowners that have all their cattle home and all the pheasants that come up to their property, they're the ones who can hardly stand them now. That's before they get the cattle back in the farms. And I think it just, it's going to be a big issue, not on the preserves, it's going to be the other guys that own property with guys shooting into their homestead and into their place of work and stuff is what's it's going to ultimately boil over. Okay, thank you, Kevin. 
Any, one last comment, if I can. Casey, Casey go ahead. Uh, one thing that uh, I don't know if it ever came up in the like in the um, marketing uh, meetings that you had and stuff like that, and it was something that uh, I think it was eight or ten years ago that I came to the commission with uh, was about you know instead of extending the season, um, you know changing the opening date, basically making it the closest Saturday to the fifteenth of October rather than um, you know the third Saturday in October, which what it does is those years when Thanksgiving falls um, at different times according to the calendar. But uh, um, if you would change it, you know, have it the 15th, the closest Saturday to the 15th every year, it'd give you five weeks between the opening weekend and Thanksgiving, which I would guess if you look at your license sales, you probably sell more licenses uh, before Thanksgiving than um any time after. Um, and I don't know if that was looked at at all, but, uh, you know, something that, you know, maybe you could, maybe if Kevin or Tom or anybody has any insight into where their license sales are at, I mean, I would think that it would maybe be more beneficial to add some days towards the front end of the season than it would be trying to extend it a whole month uh, in kind of the worst part of the season. Thank you, Casey, for those comments. And Tom, you've been around a while. I know we've had some comments about season dates at different times. I don't know if we got, I can't recall whether we had that conversation. Yeah, thanks for that question, Casey. And as you know, as well of the history, you know, number one, when you look at that start date of the third Saturday, you talk about pheasant hunting in South Dakota and all the traditions that come with it. Well, there's one of the biggest pieces of that tradition is that third Saturday of October. Um, also the, the, from the concept of, you know, putting some days on the front end of the season versus the tail end of the season, as you basically described there, you know, th that concept has been brought up over the years too. Um, you know, I think some of the things that have to come under consideration or concern about on the front end, uh, it certainly would move up earlier, especially depending on how the calendar falls, the, when the, uh, youth seasons would ultimately move up earlier, the resident only, but in particular, you think of the youth, that would be, now that it's two weekends or nine consecutive days, that would be earlier. You have the likelihood of even getting into younger birds, depending on a given year, right? That could vary a little bit, but the earlier you go, the more you get into those birds that are not as easy to identify as I'm sure you guys see that firsthand when you are hunting in early to mid-September as well. Uh, and some of those challenges, uh, unharvested crops, the, the earlier you potentially go, the likelihood you're going to have more unharvested crops, which could be harder uh, in being success, and then potentially more warm days as well. And you guys deal with that right now, right? I mean, that, that's part of your hunts in particular in September. So it's been brought up a little bit. It hasn't been discussed real at length, but those are some of the pieces of that discussion that usually come to the forefront when talking about putting days on the front end versus on the tail end. Thank you, Tom. We've got time for one more question. Otherwise, we'll be moving on. Anybody, anybody else? Okay, thank you for that uh, good in, input, uh, good questions, good comments. Appreciate everybody speaking up there. Uh, next, um, Emily, Emily Keel, I'd like to t have you take the lead on the uh, overview of the marketing campaign. Sure, can you hear me okay? We can hear you, Emily. All right, well, hello everyone. Uh, again, my name's Emily Keel. I'm the Senior Advisor to Secretary Hepler here at the Game Fish and Parks in Pier and have been with the department since 2014. I'm gonna brief you today on where we're at with the pheasant hunting marketing campaign. Some of you might be hearing this for the first time. Others, you might've heard my updates at the meeting that we had on June 11th with you, or perhaps you've been following along um, at the recent commission meetings because as we go, we have a standing slot to share information and data and analytics on the marketing return on investment efforts. So either way, uh, each of you really know what it takes to market your business and this state to draw in bird hunters year after year. So I hope you're just as excited as we are to continue the promotion and the strategic marketing efforts um, of make, you know, our state being the greatest place to hunt pheasants. 
At the South Dakota Game Fish and Parks, not only are we stewards of parks, fisheries, habitat, and wildlife, but we help to drive economic development and, and impact to our hometown communities that directly ties back to our quality of life and why we live here and why others, frankly, choose to visit here. This is certainly where each of you come into the picture as you work hard to provide for your communities and further the marketing impact that South Dakota is the greatest state in the country to hunt pheasants. You always stand ready and willing to promote pheasant hunting and on my half of the department, I just wanna thank you for that. And we probably don't say it enough. So again, thank you. Um, so just kind of taking a quick look back, we know that over the last decade, license sales have steadily declined, not only in South Dakota, but across the nation. And in 2010, we welcomed over 100,000 non-resident pheasant hunters. And in the last year, that number has dipped to approximately 63,000. Also in 2010, we had over 72,000 resident pheasant hunters. And in that last year, uh, that number's dipped to approximately 47,000. So the conscious business decisions we've made to implement this three-year pheasant hunting marketing campaign are intentional. And it, it's a key investment and partnership with the South Dakota Department of Tourism. Uh, we, all, as mentioned, you know, many times, we've also worked with an external work group that was put together earlier in the year to provide insight on what we wanted to see out of this plan and really help to set our key performance indicators and the impact that we want to have overall. But I, I just ask you to remember that this first year is critical to launching, to gathering data, and to calibrating that data and fine tuning it as we go, right? So we need three years to fully realize results. And it's about incremental growth, but we remain optimistic that we may reach our impact of increasing resident and non-resident pheasant hunters by 10% over the next three years, um, potentially sooner. So uh, stay tuned for more details on, on that as we continue to assess the return on investment and, and the data as, as, we, as we gather all that and our paid efforts are, are analyzed. Um, that partnership, as I mentioned, with Department of Tourism is something we remain very excited about. It makes good business sense that we work together on this. Uh, tourism has the visitor industry research tools. They know the markets. They're experts at getting people to come to South Dakota. And at Game Fish and Parks, we know pheasant hunting. We know the landscape and we know our users. Tourism's research programs allow us to gain insight on our users like never before and track how those target audiences engage with our campaign messaging. Um, and just a reminder, or for some of you who are unsure who our target audiences are, uh, there's three of them. So the traditionalist, which are resident and non-resident hunters, male and female, age 45 to 64. The adventure hunters, again, both resident and non-resident, male and female, ages 18 to 44. And then our third one is lapsed youth resident and non-resident again, as well as male and female, age 18 to 35. In our target markets, there's 16 states, so bear with me. Um, I know you'll be interested in this. South Dakota, Minnesota, Iowa, Wisconsin, Michigan, Nebraska, Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, Utah, Colorado, Kansas, Missouri, Arkansas, Oklahoma, and Texas. Um, now I really want to get into the details of the campaign analytics to date. And a reminder, again, we've only been active in our campaign efforts for about a month. So we've got some really exciting uh, stuff up ahead. Uh, in the email invitation you guys got, we invited you to preview huntthegreatest.com. If you didn't, that's fine, but uh, please take some time to, to go visit that site. That's our campaign website and it's the driving force of this effort. Uh, to date, we've had about 7,000 page views, and folks are spending about two minutes on that site. Um, and that, that number gets bigger as I go on, so, so stay with me here as we tell the whole story. The top five locations for visiting the website include Sioux Falls, Minneapolis, Chicago, Denver, and Dallas, all in our top market areas that I just, uh, in the states that I just described. And that top age group is 25 to 34. Um, reach to date, so this includes all of our website traffic plus our paid efforts in the last 30 days. It's over 3 million. And 
there's a lot that comes into play uh, to get to such a large impact or reach like this. And there's so much more to come online in the next couple of weeks with our traditional and digital efforts. But let me explain that 3 million and how that all kind of comes together. So um, the first two week flight of our TV just wrapped up. So that will ramp back up again in September, I believe. The print ads have just hit homes and newsstands. We have print ads in the Pheasants Forever Journal, the Quail Forever Journal, and Covey Rides. If you're not familiar with Covey Rides, it's an upland lifestyle magazine that targets the high-end hunter. And that necessarily isn't one of our main target audiences or markets, but it certainly runs parallel with our other ones and, and not to be forgotten. So we've got more to come with Covey Rides. Um, but those public relations efforts are still being worked out behind the scenes. Um, tying back to our digital efforts, the Meat Eater podcast, audio ads are up and running. So if you're, listening, if you're a fan of that podcast, you should be hearing our ads there. The paid search has driven nearly 75,000 individual session, sessions, excuse me, to our Game Fish and Parks website. So, you know, they, they get to our Hunt the Greatest site, that drives them then to gfp.st.gov where the opportunity lies with getting folks to make the purchase of a small game hunting license. Um, so what really does paid search mean? In short, you know, say I bring up my browser and I go to Google. From there, I type in a word or phrase like pheasant hunting or pheasant hunting in South Dakota or where should I pheasant hunt in South Dakota? A lot of your lodges come up uh, when you do that, but we've also, um, at the state level invested in making sure that our Hunt the Greatest campaign is front and center in those searches uh, for our specific audiences, remember. Um, so some of you may or may not see that, but um, we also are doing that through our digital ads that have been created. And so those will show up on our target audiences, social channels as well, and get them to, to click on those ads and get them to the huntthegreatest.com site and eventually to uh, the purchasing site, um, which really is where that return on investment comes into play. Our top performing audience for all of this is that adventure naturalist group in regards to our social media leads and our website traffic. So, and that there's a li little bit of an overlap with our last youth group as well there. Um, but more, more marketing efforts are yet to come. We've got a Shields in store promotion in uh, obviously Rapid City and Sioux Falls, Eau Claire, Omaha, Minneapolis stores are to name a few. We've got some digital banners that will continue to come online. All of our paid social efforts are yet to come. And then KFAN Radio, we've got ads with them and that's the uh, prime radio network for the Minnesota Vikings, for any of you Vikings fans out there. Um, and this is really some exciting news here and it's, it's really fresh. So there's, there's some deep diving we have to get back into, but what I can report in terms of licensed sales to date that directly tie back to our marketing campaign, um, 3,814 licenses sold um, as it relates to our marketing efforts. That equates to 83,000 in sales about. And that information is really consistent with what we're seeing um, with our hunting and fishing license and sales and the upward trend that that has produced too. Um, again, that's really fresh. So I, I wanna be able to dive into that a little bit further um, here in the, in the coming days, but pretty excited to see those results. Um, then we are also advertising for a 2021 hunt giveaway for four. And to date we've had just about 1500 total signups and we're averaging about a hundred of those per day. And we expect to see a, an increase with the Shields uh, in-store promotion signage and the digital retargeting that will be coming online with that soon. Um, that hunt giveaway also has some corporate sponsorships that are pieced together there. Danner Boots and Benelli are providing boots and shotguns to the winner and their guests. Um, so that's pretty cool. Sal Roseland with r, r Pheasant Hunting is going to be our lodge partner for the giveaway. So we thank him for partnering with us on that. Um, lastly, I just wanna make sure that we cover COVID um, because that is the world in which we're living in and words like COVID, pandemic, coronavirus now play a part in our everyday language. So we've also made it a direct message that in South Dakota, we offer a safe place to recreate and our outdoors are open. 
And, and that's been consistent since COVID hit, right? That our outdoors are open. And I know myself and my family, we can't think of a better way to stay six feet apart this fall than um, walking in the fields together, hunting roosters with friends, family who will be traveling here. Um, and and that's, that's what we wanna see. We wanna see our new and our old hunters um, out there and, and participating in the outdoors that way too. Additionally, um, with that whole outdoors are open, South Dakota is a safe place to be. We'll continue to share information about the fact that South Dakota is one of the few places in the world where folks can bag the upland bird trifecta from sharp-tailed grouse, prairie chicken, and the pheasant all in the same hunt. Uh, as you all know too, we offer excellent walleye fishing in Missouri River and the Glacial Lakes region. And then we'll connect with our state park offerings uh, with the campsites, the modern campings, uh, modern camp cabins, excuse me, and then um, making sure that those lodge opportunities are also complete with the outdoor adventure for the entire family. So that is what I have um, for the marketing update Arden. I'll let you see if there's any questions that anybody has for me. I know Kirk Colstein is also part of this session too. He's with the Department of Tourism um, and I'm sure he'd be happy to take any questions that folks have too. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. I do have a comment. Emily, when you talk about the Viking fans, they know it's much more productive to come over here and hunt pheasants and root for their team. So I'm not surprised we see those people interested over in Minnesota land. <laughs> for, for everyone yeah, that's coming. aware, um, Secretary Heffler is a huge Packers fan. So. Mm. All right, Emily, thanks for that great update. Kelly, not so much, but um, anybody else have any comments or questions for the, Emily or Kirk or anybody else? Okay, thank you, Emily, appreciate that. Um, we'll also ha hopefully have a few minutes at the very end if somebody thinks of something between now and then to ask, that'd be great. Um, Kevin Roebling, again, uh, Deputy Secretary Roebling, would you give a, an update on the Second Century Fund? Yeah, absolutely, Arden. Uh, a little bit just uh, going to give a heads up here, and, and Kurt Corzon is also on the phone, and he is a member of the Second Century Habitat Board. But to rewind a little bit, um, this board was put into place really to promote and enhance habitat stewardship and raise money for habitat. And, and we are very fortunate, this department's very fortunate to have a governor that supports these efforts wholeheartedly. Um, you know, making sure the next hundred years are as good as the last, that second century initiative. And that is critical to the future of South Dakota um, and habitat's front and center in that discussion. So. We are very fortunate to really showcase this effort, the effort of habitat awareness, habitat promotion, and habitat enhancement. And that is something that uh, this board has been charged to do, um, essentially generate funds, uh, generate awareness, and uh, generate that habitat stewardship mentality across South Dakota. Their mission specifically says they wanna be advocates of habitat stewardship, collaborate with community partners and be conservation leaders to, be, to benefit all of South Dakota. And that's what they're working on right now. Their board has just been uh, put together here in the last, I would say nine to 12 months is really when it's, it, we had new members arrive. Uh, we have a president, uh, Jim Skull from Mountain Rapid City. He's the president of the board and their mission and uh, their day-to-day -day efforts are to do exactly that be advocates of habitat stewardship and collaborate with community partners to raise funds for habitat. So saying all that, um, one of the things they are working on is a habitat video. And this is hopefully where the preserve folks and the preserve operators themselves um, come into play. And this habitat video really does focus on the next hundred years. It focuses on uh, promoting habitat, promoting our outdoor heritage, our hunting heritage, and the deep rooted traditions here that we have in South Dakota and that we all love and cherish. And that's what this video, it's gonna be a two to three minute video. Uh, we're hoping to have this thing wrapped up by September 1st. And then the ask at the end of the video is, you know, to give a donation if, if your hunters or any hunters out there or any outdoor enthusiasts are, are willing to give a donation towards the Second Century Habitat Fund. Um, we're gonna share the video with all the preserve operators. Uh, we ask that you could show it to your clientele. Um, Again, it could be a good place for it. It would be at like your safety briefing, 
or when you show maybe a safety video, uh, maybe just an introduction video to South Dakota. There'll be some storytelling in there. Um, we're hoping to get Governor Noem right on there as well to story tell, you know, the importance of habitat in our hunting tradition. So it's an exciting piece that uh, hopefully will generate some, some donations uh, that go directly towards the habitat. We are working on the Second Century Working Lands Program. And uh, as you know, we did get allocated a million dollars from the legislature back in 2018. And those funds we used um, almost all the way up now that we got about 5,000 acres of habitat on the landscape um, that we can say that seed in the ground, um, it's a five-year working lands program and it's, it's exciting, we need more of that. So the focus is habitat and this board is put into place to do exactly that. Um, so yeah, once the video is conducted and complete, we'll have it on our website, it'll be on the Habitat Pays website and we'd love to share it with all the preserve operators across South Dakota. So. Any questions on that piece or anything uh, that the board is, is currently seeking to do? And Kurt or, or Kelly, uh, Kelly also sits on the board. Anything to add? Thank you, Kevin. Appreciate that overview. Um, Kurt, I don't know if you're uh, on the call, would like to share any, any words? Any questions for for Kevin in regards to the Second Century Fund? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to the Upland Game Bird Association. Kurt Corzan, Kurt, are you on the call? Would you like to give an overview of your organization? Uh, Arden, I think he might be having an issue getting off mute. I just received a text, so. Okay. Let's see. I wonder if, you, yeah, if you'd be able to use the chat function or, um, let's see here. Is it, Arden, is it star six, is that? Yeah, that's what I heard. I never, it didn't have to do it on my phone, but some people said that star six was enabled the, the person. Can you hear me now, Arden? We can, can you hear, hear you, now? Kurt. Yes, we can hear oh. you. Okay, you great. Very clear. Sorry. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I want to introduce myself, Kurt Corzan with Grand Slam Pheasant Hunt in Kimball, South Dakota. Been in business 37 years now. My wife and I started it. Um, as a lot of people on here know, um, the pheasant hunting industry really didn't have any what you call true representation to go with game fishing parks or discuss things with legislature. So a year and a half ago, a group of us met and uh, we decided to start the South Dakota Upland Outfitters Association. And one of the main things was, was so that we could have representation in the state. And the other thing that we really are going to push is our youth hunting. We feel as though that the youth of today is lacking that hunting experience and we want to be able to get them out into the field and, and experience without any cost to them. And so that's what we're going to work on. And the other thing is, of course, everybody knows that habitat is a major concern. That's one thing we want to do. And as you all know, um, we're face to face with the majority of hunters that come into the state of South Dakota. And with some of the plans that we have, um, we think we can raise a substantial amount of money to help with this. Um, I will give you, for those of you listening, I will give you a little bit. Um, when this first started, right after it happened, my youngest son was in a very bad auto accident. So I kind of had to put it on hold because he had three young daughters. My wife and I ended up taking care of them for about four or five months. So it kind of put us behind and then the COVID thing hit. So that's kind of put us behind, but we just held a meeting Monday and we're going to get going strong again. I will tell you, I've met with the governor a couple of times. She is very much in favor of us. I've met with several legislatures. She's in favor of us. So um, I think we have a great, great opportunity to close a barrier that I think has been lacking between the game fishing parks and maybe even somewhat the legislatures that we can all come together. I will say the, the, the um, 
the people that are sitting on the board is I think is a very high quality professional group of people. I'll tell you who they are. Um, I'm the president. Vice president is Tammy Nelson. A board member is Christine Sawinski. I believe it's Rieger Lodge. Marshall Springer is with Buffalo Butte Lodge. We just added Sal Roseland with R and R, and then um, Denny Raleigh from over at Alexandria. And um, our executive secretary is Anita Holon. She's from Kimball. So um, for those of you that haven't been contacted, you will get contacted. We don't mean to leave anybody out, but I will say that this group is so focused on working with game fishing parks, working with the legislature, and working with the sportsmen of South Dakota so that we can bring everybody together, look forward, and make things better. I, I just and, and from the feedback I've gotten, it's been very positive. It, it really has. And I think one thing about people in our industry, we have so much data that we can share with, with game fishing parks to help you progress. And, it, and I tried to, tried to get in on Emily, but for some reason I, I couldn't get on in. But um, um, for data for your advertising committee, National Shooting Sports Foundation has so much data and I don't know if they've looked at it, but it'll show you the states that are gaining in hunter hunters in the states that are dropping. So you may want to look at that just to focus a little bit on that to see where you can target where your hunters are increasing and maybe not target so much on the states that are, are decreasing so you can be a little more efficient. But but uh, we're we're all looking very forward to to working and I've talked to Kelly Hepler a few times and we're all looking forward to working with you guys and I I think everybody in this industry um, we all we all try to make things better and better and better so so hopefully you'll all get contacted it's just a matter of time and and it's kind of an apologize for what had happened but it was kind of out of my hands but but it will uh, it will take place and and I think overall working together as a team with the whole state we're just going to make things better and and uh, one thing I had mentioned at our second century fund is I don't want any more hunters going to Nebraska or North Dakota or whatever. I want them to come into South Dakota. So, and I think, I think we can make it work. I really do. So, and if anybody has any questions for me, um, um, please feel free to, to ask me and uh, be more than glad to help you or, or uh, work with you in any way we can. Thank you, Kurt, for that uh, good overview. Um, anybody have any questions or comments for Kurt? That was easy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you'll get some. I'm sure you'll get some follow up, Kurt. And well, we've yeah. had we've had a good response so far. Um, we really have, and I and I can say it. At, at the few meetings that I've held, the people that are there, they're saying, yeah. And I, I'm going to be right up front with you. I, I think there's always been kind of a barrier between from past administrations with Game Fish and Parks. There's always kind of been a little bit of a barrier that, you know, it was just, well, should we or shouldn't we? And I, I think we're at a point in time where everybody wants to come together. And I think we've got the right people there that are willing to work with us and we're willing to work with them. And, and we will make it better. I can, I can guarantee you it will end up being better throughout the state. It really will. Because I think we can all sit down as a group and, and share our experiences and, and what our concerns are. And we can come to a, a simple solution. I really do. So, but thank you so much. Thank you, Kurt. And, you know, that's really the purpose of this meeting, the one we had in June, and, and continuing that dialogue and continuing to work together and, and make sure that um, we're communicating and, and, and sharing thoughts. And I think that has been uh, evident today in our conversation. So appreciate that. Um, with that, what do what's out there yet for, you know, open discussion or questions or comments from anybody that either that we didn't cover today or that somebody that wasn't able to get in and that wished they had a comment earlier. Um, got a few minutes here for for some of that before we wrap up. So um, open up the floor for anybody else that wants to speak. I'll Kevin, say, okay. So when, when Emily does all that, that stuff, um, the marketing, Part does she is it just a promotion for pheasants or I mean is it like is it fishing involved in it too the 
waterfall, deer hunting. I mean, is it like goes on what the whole entire state that we have to offer? Go ahead, Emily. Yeah. Thanks for that question. And I appreciate that because it'll give me an opportunity to clarify. Our paid efforts in this partnership is just for pheasant hunting. Just for pheasant hunting. When I mentioned the, the COVID piece and some of those additional um, points that we will continue to market our state for yet this fall, those are in addition to some public relations messaging that will run parallel mm -hmm. to the paid efforts. The paid efforts are pheasant hunting. Okay. And that's marketed towards resident and non-resident hunters. Yeah, mostly for the non-residents out of state, right? And that's who you're ultimately targeting, right? Yep. So those keys, those 16 states. Yep. It, it, it's yep. South, South Dakota is included as well, but I mean, and that's, um, you know, those other ones are, are the primary and secondary states. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah, with that being said, so, so what, you know, this is a pheasant call with all pheasant guides in the industry. So I don't know if the game, if the game commissioners are still on the call or not, but same thing at the game fish parks, you know, us as industry, you know, we welcome pheasant industry, us pheasant preserves, and you guys, we welcome in all the pheasant hunters we possibly can get in from non-residents. And then, and then we get back to the duck hunting and the deer hunting and stuff like that. I mean, I read an article the other day on, I think it was on Fox News, I think it was, they are talking about how North Dakota is going to get slam dunk with non-resident duck hunters this year because you can't get into Canada because of COVID. And they were talking about the whole entire article. And then on the very bottom, it says there will be no additional non-resident hunters in the state of South Dakota because their lottery license is already passed. And it was a whole article how, how since Canada is not getting hunted, how it might change the flyaway and this and this and that. But for us being pheasant guys, you know, we, we welcome it all in. And I know the game commission, you guys at the game fish and parks try to do as much as you can to get the waterfall license, you know, where you can buy it over the counter. And I just want to hopefully encourage you guys to keep working on that. And I know it has to go through the state legislators. I know all that, but that's something that we can get more hunters to come in here to do things. Plus you guys could sell more licenses because there'll be a lot of guys that would go shoot ducks on the farmer's local property two hours before they go pheasant hunting if they can buy the license over the counter. But again, we can't, you know, we can't do that until that gets changed. And then another thing with, uh, when we talk about what Iowa does, what Minnesota does and what Kansas does, I mean, I get, I don't, I mean, I don't think we should talk about like Kansas. They sell a non-resident pheasant license for $90 for the whole entire year. We sell, two five day or you know two five day periods for 150. Minnesota you don't even have to have a preserve license to hunt on the preserves and no pheasants get tagged and everything else you know so so to me what other states do that's what they do if we're gonna say well Kansas hunts until February 1st well, let's do what they do because they do to me you know our state is unique as being the best state to be so to me we need to be the shepherd of the herd, not the sheep that follows the shepherd. We shouldn't so much, I mean, we should, if we're gonna follow what the other states do, we should take more of what they do, like decrease license for sales, you know, decrease the, what the license fees and everything cost, extend the limits and everything else, you know, where it's $90 for a full day for a whole year license. But, so when we just come constantly compare, well, they start here, they start here, they stop here. Well, I think, you know, that's where we're different. We can stay our own, so. I just encourage you guys to keep pushing, you know, for us and to get more opportunities for people to come so they can do more things. And I appreciate the call you guys do and everything else. And, we, and I appreciate you guys calling us for our input on some of these things before they get, you know, 100% put to the commissions and our ideas of it. Because, again, it affects us the most than anybody else. So thanks for you guys' time. Thank you, Kevin. Sure appreciate that. Any other? Emily, yeah. Emily, yeah. this is Kurt. On your committee, is there anybody from the um, from the preserves or in the pheasant hunting industry sitting on that committee for your advertising? Yeah, so that work group um, was formulated in February. We had um, 
Jim Skull from, from the Second Century Board. We had a member from the South Dakota Retailers Association. And then we had the chambers represented, but we did not have a preserve operator. Okay, I mean, it doesn't have to be a preserve operator. It could be somebody, I would, my suggestion to you would maybe be put somebody on that, on that committee. Um, we live it, see it, breathe it, work it every day. So it might not be a bad idea if you added somebody to that committee that's in the pheasant hunting industry. Okay. Just a suggestion. No, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Any other any other comments or questions from the group here today? Okay, we're getting uh, close to wrap up time. So, um, first first of all, I'd like to ask you know for some feedback on you know how how are these meetings working? Are they effective? Um, is there a time of day when we would be better? Um, Give us some feedback on whether you think these are effective and, and whether we should be looking at some different uh, ways of communicating with you folks. The Anyone? Time, the, times and days, the times and days and whatever work for us as long as you, you know, let us know a month of time, you know, like you guys have been. So I mean, it's no different than scheduling to go to the doctor's appointment. You just make time to want to be part of it. You make time to be part of it if you don't, whatever. So I think the times work fine for me. Okay. Anyone else? You guys all made it work today, so probably um, can speak into the choir here a little bit. Folks that weren't here maybe have a different opinion. But you, you um, I want to leave you with a couple numbers here, too, before I forget a little bit later, too. Um, Janelle? Uh, Janelle Blaha's number, uh, you probably all have that readily available, but it's 605-773-7665, right, Janelle? Yep, and then my number is 605-359-0654. Um, you can reach out to us afterwards if you have any questions, if you have our emails. Uh, there's other folks on here that you may have their contact information, and that's all right, too. Just want to make sure we we left that with you as well. Um, yes, we have a question. Yes, Janelle. Oh, you gotta get closer again, Janelle. Two two three, not seven seven three. Oh yeah, two, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I had the prefix on Janelle's right. Is it uh, wrong? Is it two two three? Correct. Yeah, six zero five two two three. 7665 is Janelle's number. I'm sorry about that. I had the peer number, not the Fort Peer number. So apologize. Um, Secretary Hepler, do you have any comments um, kind of as a wrap up for us today? No, I just want to thank everybody. I think it was a great conversation. And even in this format, like those conversations we're having the two commissioners, you know, Kevin and others, those comments you're talking, you know, Casey about those proposals on, on peasants are good because you're gonna have much more opportunity to have that discussion here than it gets a little more formalized once you get on the record. You know, typically it's three minutes is normally what the commissioner allows you to do. So it's all good input. You know, I will say, you know, it's it's normally when a proposal is in front of the commission, they always assume it's a GFMP proposal and we're pushing it. But there's a lot of times they'll work in concert like with these proposals with the commission to say, okay, even though the data may suggest that, we also recognize it's very much a social thing with people and what they feel and impacts everybody differently. And so we'll float those ideas out there just to get the, exactly the input we're getting today to say, all right, what are the pros and cons of doing that? Because a lot of times there's unintended consequences, other times they're not. Then based on all that public input, the commission will come back, I'm sure, Gary, you're going to come back and ask us, you know, GFMP, what do you want to do in those proposals? They'll ask us that at some point during the course of our conversation then we'll formulate that. And if you ask me what our opinion is right now, I mean, I have my own personal opinion, but as far as a department of opinion, I think we're still listening and taking that input in. So um, we're not, I can tell you right now, we're not falling on a sword in any of these. So we're just interested and see where they go. And I think the commission's the same way. There's certain times we will come in from the commission. We feel very strongly about something, particularly if it's dr definitely driven biologically or for sustained yield reasons, then we will fall on our sword. We'll let everybody know that ahead of time. And we're not trying to be coy. This is just one of those ones we truly are interested in seeing what people are having to say. 
then based on that, we can collectively decide you know, what's best to move forward in the state. And that's really where we're at. <clears throat> um, but yeah, and, and I appreciate, Kurt, your comment about getting somebody in the work group. We can certainly do that. I saw uh, the chair also take a note of that, Commissioner Jensen. So we'll, we'll certainly can make that happen, Kurt. And if you have any, any good suggestions too, I mean, that, that's nice. There's 186 operators or something. Is there somebody that you think would really be good at that, Kurt? Please let us know that. We'd appreciate that. So anyway, I just want to thank everybody. Um, I also want to thank the Upland Bird Association. You know, I, it's, it's a lot easier for us and then just efficiency to be able to have an organization we can go to and talk to. And we fully understand there's times you're gonna take a position probably different than GFNP. That's perfectly fine. That's what the system is designed for. But then you, then you have that organization and I don't know if you're gonna get all 186 preserve operators with that or not. I mean, that you guys will do what you can do. I hope you do, um, but it's really helpful. And I think it's helpful for the process to have an organization like that, not only for legislative process, but just, just landowner relationships community relationships working, you know, with the Wildlife Federation and others. So, you know, I thank you everybody for your time today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Kelly. Um, Commissioners Jensen and Locke, I appreciate you joining in today. Do you have any uh, comments or anything that you would like to share before leaving today? No, I just would thank everybody too. And, you know, one of the commission's main responsibilities, if not the main responsibility, is to get public input, see what the public thinks about different ideas and different concepts, and then try to make the decision that's best for everybody, find the right balance. And this will help do that. Sometimes I suppose we get it done, other times maybe we don't, but we, that's what we try to do. So thanks everybody for participating today. Thank you, Gary. Anything, anything to add there, Commissioner Locken, or you, you good? I would just say that I don't think anybody's firmly made a decision on any of these proposals and, uh, and appreciate the opportunity to, to, to uh, listen in on the meeting and uh, let's see where it goes. Thank you. Deputy Secretary Roebling, any final comments from you? Nope, just looking forward to future conversations. Again, um, if you want to formally submit a comment, John did put... Uh, the forms and position um, positions uh, link there is a URL. So please click on that link and you can actually submit your comments there. Um, yeah, we, we're, we're really wanting to hear from folks and spread the word as well. Uh, we have that September 2nd commission meeting. It's a Wednesday, Thursday, so it's not a Thursday, Friday. So keep note of your calendars. It's a Wednesday, Thursday starts at 1 p.m. Uh, Central time and our public hearing will be at 2 p.m. So. If you wanted to call in, it's going to be a Zoom call, uh, very similar to this. Um, please follow that and call in and uh, make sure your comments are heard. So again, 2 p.m. Uh, September 2nd. So with that, that's all I wanted to add and just wanted to say thank you for everybody that joined us today. So thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. And once again, uh, appreciate all of you sharing your comments today. Your your input is valuable to us. It really does make a difference and it's really helpful for us. Uh, we manage these resources for everybody in the state and all of our visitors and, and it's really important to hear from you folks. So um, let's keep this going. Let's, let's have some future conversations and uh, appreciate every, everybody's time. So we'll see y'all. Thank you all. Thanks.